so to start with some session logistics, um, just to remind everyone, uh, the chat function is live for all attendees to use. And um, please post your questions in the Q&A discussion and we'll are in the Q&A box and we'll have some discussion on all of the talks. Uh, the uh, chat questions will be, uh, we'll, we'll try to monitor that as well, but Q&A is the place to post your questions. Uh, and also as a reminder, this session is recorded. So we have a great lineup of speakers today. Um, I'll introduce them each before their talk, um, starting with Dr. Jody Petraska, then uh, Dr. Danielle McCarthy, Dr. Matthew Carpenter, and Dr. Steve Higgins. And then finally, I wanna remind everyone to attend our poster sessions tonight. The first session starts at 4.15, and the second session starts at 5.15. So uh, first up on our uh, uh, first talk speaker today is Dr. Jody Petraska. I'm very excited to hear her talk today on smoking cessation among those with mental illness. Dr. Petraska is a professor of medicine at Stanford University and a member of the Stanford Cancer Institute and a licensed clinical psychologist with addiction medicine privileges at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. She's deputy director of the Stanford Prevention Research Center and co-director of their T32 postdoctoral training program, as well as a faculty director for Stanford's Master of Science program in community health and prevention research. Dr. Petraska's work centers on identifying health solutions that address leading risk behaviors in neglected and disenfranchised individuals and populations. Her research spans community-based epidemiologic studies, randomized controlled treatment trials, and policy analyses. I'm very much looking forward to her talk today. So with that, Dr. Petraska, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'll share my slides. Okay. Wonderful. Really pleased to be a part of the meeting today. And I've enjoyed the sessions earlier this morning. I'll be talking with you today about smoking cessation among those with mental illness. My disclosures, my grant funding comes from the National Institutes of Health, the state of California. I consult to the WHO, to Achieve Life Sciences, to Carrot, which is a technology company in the smoking cessation space, uh, Merck Manuals, and I've served as an expert witness uh, for plaintiff, plaintiff counsel in litigation against tobacco companies, uh, including Juul. So my focus today is on individuals with mental illness and helping them quit smoking. I will focus on the individual, the person, um, but as you heard earlier today in Dr. Benowitz's talk, that when you focus just on the individual, it can be very hard to reach and engage them. Uh, also, if we only focus on the individual, um, we'll see a lot of failure because there's a lot going on in their environment and in terms of the product and what they're exposed to and in the treatment settings that they're in uh, that impacts the success and the likelihood of quitting. So today I'll talk about the person, the place, the providers, the product, the promotion, and look a little bit to policy. Uh, when I talk, I'm gonna talk, focus on those with mental illness, um, but there can be some overlapping um, circles here, uh, different populations that, that overlap. Uh, in research, sometimes we do focus in on those with mental illness and do a diagnostic interview. That takes time. So in epi research, um, a briefer measure would be looking at serious psychological distress, uh, which we'll share some characteristics with, but can be a broader or even a different group. And then don't want to forget those with substance use disorders. Substance use disorders can co-occur with mental illness, uh, so that you'd have somebody who's duly diagnosed. Uh, but my talk today really is going to focus more on those with mental illness, just to, to be focused on time. I also want to recognize that you can also see elevated symptoms of depression or anxiety. We've certainly been seeing that during the pandemic. Uh, this is a study from the Kaiser Family Foundation showing a um, about fourfold increase in anxiety and depressive symptoms. And Amanda Graham's talk earlier this morning, uh, she, she noted that it was, I think, 40% of young adults in their recent uh, technology study for quitting vaping uh, had high levels of depression or anxiety. So behavioral health populations, if we think broadly, um, they consume about 40% of cigarettes sold in the United States. It's a very you know, huge number of cigarettes. It's a huge market in terms of dollars for tobacco companies, and it leads to significant health harms that we're well, well aware of. 
The smoking prevalence over time in the US has declined in the general population and it's at 14% of adults now. Uh, while declines in the prevalence has gone down, that absolute number has stayed fairly constant, constant because of population growth. So it's still about 40 million adults to use tobacco, use cigarettes, smoke cigarettes. And while we've seen this decline in the general population, what we see among those with mental illness or serious psychological distress is that their rates of smoking uh, remain very high, remain elevated compared to those with no mental illness or no psych serious psychological distress. And the data I show here, you, you see the, the, um, the timeline across the top, uh, be it in the early 90s out to more present day, uh, we see very high levels of smoking, those are the blue bars, among those with a mental illness or with psych serious psychological distress. And then some studies, not, not too many, so these data are a little bit older, um, look at smoking prevalence within different diagnostic categories. And we see particularly high levels of smoking among those with say bipolar disorder, psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, and then also substance use disorders. We also see elevations in product use across the different tobacco product categories. So whether it's cigarettes, whether it's e-cigarettes, whether it's smokeless cigars or, or any tobacco product use. We also see elevated um, use of menthol smoking among individuals who smoke. If they have serious psychological distress, uh, they're more likely to use menthol uh, than, than those who don't have serious psychological distress and smoke. Now I'm gonna shift to place and providers. And I appreciate this quote from Dr. Chambers. How is it that our mental health research, let me just get rid of the photos. How, did, how is it that our mental health research and clinical communities focus so exclusively on beneficial effects of smoking in populations who suffer the most from it? Uh, what do we mean by that is there's been this focus on this kind of self-medication hypothesis that these individuals, um, because the problems are so high, there's this assumption that it, it must need to be so. It must be serving uh, perhaps a, a, a self-medication effect uh, that these individuals need to smoke to manage their symptoms. So in the environments in which mental health, mental illness is treated, uh, there have often been exceptions to allow smoking to be used in these settings uh, because there's a view that these individuals, these patients need to smoke. Uh, also, um, providers may even smoke with the patients, which is very unique to psychiatric settings. Um, this was a study that was done to look at um, the particle levels, um, particulate uh, mass levels of um, from secondhand smoke exposure in these settings, um, be it if there's smoking allowed in the room in a communal area, indoor with smoking rooms. Um, so a smoking room, but still what's the air quality in, in that setting. Uh, if there's an indoor ban, but people are allowed to smoke outside and often it's, it's near the setting, uh, or if there's a total indoor-outdoor ban. And it's only when you get a full indoor-outdoor ban that you've got the kind of protection that you would want against secondhand smoke for health, um, for optimizing health. Okay, so that's what we see in terms of the harms of being um, allowing smoking in different at different levels in these settings. And yet when we look nationally, the extent to which mental health treatment settings have gone and prohibited smoking, uh, both indoors and outdoors, it's a minority of treatment settings. Um, Oklahoma is doing the best, which is, which is notable across the state. Um, but in many of the areas, you know, it's, it's less than half of mental health treatment settings are prohibiting smoking indoors and out. Uh, this shows again that less than half have a tobacco ban, less than half are doing tobacco screening, uh, just over a third are providing some kind of cessation counseling, um, about a quarter providing NRT or other cessation medication. And then even if they do have a smoke-free ban, which is great, that's super important, it's not that those settings are necessarily um, optimizing care for treating tobacco. Uh, so a minority, you know, it, providing cessation counseling, NRT, or cessation medications. What happens when you have a smoke-free ban and then people leave the setting? Uh, this is early work that I did at UCSF at, at Langley Porter, which was one of the first psychiatric hospitals to have a smoking ban for its inpatient unit. And what we found is that when patients were hospitalized on average about a week, once they left the hospital, they nearly immediately went back to smoking uh, within minutes. Uh, for the most part, smoking on the sidewalk outside of Langley Porter. 
and um, gave me this idea of setting up like a Lucy cart where I would hand out, um, you know, quitline cards and patches um, on the sidewalk to help people quit as they're leaving. I'll come back to what we ultimately did for treatment in the inpatient setting, but um, just really shows you what happens when you don't address tobacco with patients when they're hospitalized. Um, some of the quotes we heard from patients when we called them was that they had been advised by the nursing team to um, take the patch off when they were leaving because the assumption was that they were going to go out and smoke. Uh, another patient saying that they, you know, bummed a cigarette off the coffee cart uh, staff member. Um, in terms of providing treatment, a uh, survey done, it is a bit of time ago, but among psychiatrists, a majority saying that they ask about tobacco use and advise patients to quit. Um, but far fewer as assisting providing uh, pharmacotherapy or referring to outside treatment. And psychiatrists were the least likely to address tobacco use with their patients compared to other medical specialties in the survey. We did a survey of um, individuals with bipolar disorder. This is an online survey collaboration with the uh, Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. And um, very few of the patients or the individuals reported that a psychiatrist, a therapist, or a case manager had ever advised them to quit smoking. And several reported that they were discouraged to quit um, by mental health providers uh, who advised that it was just too much for them to handle. So why does this happen? Why are mental health providers not addressing tobacco at a great level with their patients? And there was a meta-analysis done to summarize the number of studies that have been done. Uh, about a majority said that they believe their patients don't want to quit. Uh, nearly half had permissive attitudes towards smoking and just over a third thought that quitting smoking would be too stressful for the patients. And yet, what do we see when we survey individuals? And there's a number of studies that have been done in my lab, outside of my lab. And consistently what is shown is that those with mental health concerns, mental illness, are just as ready to quit smoking as the general population. Uh, so Neil was talking about 70% of, of individuals who smoke want to quit. And we see very similar rates to that uh, in, among those with mental illness or substance use disorders. Further, we don't see any relationship between the severity of the psychiatric symptoms and their readiness to quit. Uh, so clinically, you might think, you know, as a treatment provider, patients too depressed, I'll bring it up later. But when we ask patients, they say, you know, no, you know, my depression may never get better. Um, and so they're just as receptive as the general population to interventions for quitting smoking. Smoking also is relevant to psychiatric care. There's a number of medications for which smoking induces the metabolism so that the individual has lower levels of the um, psychiatric medication than they would if they were a non-smoker. So it's within the purview, it's relevant to psychiatric care to address tobacco use. What about this idea that quitting is too stressful? Uh, there's a wonderful meta-analysis that was published and it looked in the general population, it looked among those with psychiatric symptoms, and it found that if you quit smoking, it's associated with long-term reductions in depression, in anxiety, and in stress. And on the other side, it's also associated with improved positive mood states and quality of life. All right, we're going to shift again to the product and promotion. So why are these individuals using this product at such a high level? Um, there has been marketing and attention to them by the tobacco industry. I think everybody knows this group, um, but the next documents that I'll share come from the Truth Library. Um, this was a kind of a deep dive that I did to look at the extent to which the tobacco industry has been interested in the self-medication hypothesis, uh, specifically among individuals with schizophrenia. I identified 28 proposals, seven, seven were funded, and they were all on this self-medicating hypothesis. Um, the 21 unfunded studies looked at things like smoking prevalence and health harms of smoking and so forth. Some of the earliest interest I saw by the tobacco industry was noting that here was a group that was smoking at very high levels and yet had a lower um, prevalence than would be expected of lung cancer. And so this idea that if we can show that these individuals, you know, aren't getting lung cancer and yet they're smoking at high levels and we can like break, you know, or, or put a little um, uncertainty in terms of the causal role of smoking and lung cancer. The issue was that those with schizophrenia back in the 50s weren't living long enough to get lung cancer or they were in settings where perhaps their lung cancer wasn't detected. 
Another interest in schizophrenia was this idea that perhaps it's a psychosomatic, maybe it's an emotional state that's causing cancer, not, not tobacco, not the smoke, um, but people repressing their emotions. And so they had this idea they could study those with schizophrenia because they believed that they did not show emotions, that they were repressing their emotions and that they had low levels of um, cancer. Um, the concern with this is that um, the tobacco industry might be appearing to finance um, give publicity to an immense smoke screen because the methods in these studies were not rigorous. Uh, when there was disinterest in funding a research, research proposal, there was discussion of perhaps reworking the design uh, to use the methods to um, something that would serve the tobacco companies. And then the research that was funded um, tended to be among individuals who were outside of the country who had a track record of doing the kind of research that served the industry. Um, and in this case, the, the individual was promising to bear fruitful findings. And they did fund them. Uh, the industry also um, was connected to articles that kind of promoted the self-medication hypothesis of nicotine, this one titled Nicotine Helping Those Who Help Themselves. Uh, and the individual who wrote this um, wasn't in the mental health field, but had a long um, track record of funding by tobacco companies. The hospital smoking bans, um, JCO, the Joint Commission on Accreditation for Hospitals, um, moved hospitals to be smoke free in the early 90s, but there was this exemption that, an exemption that was um, put into place for psychiatric facilities and, and addiction treatment settings. Uh, in the documents, there is correspondence that I could see between the Alliance for Mentally Ill, which is a really important advocacy group for those with mental illness, uh, and Philip Morris. And ultimately, as I mentioned, there was this exception made for psychiatric facilities to allow um, tobacco use in their settings. And then the industry also would um, track the kind of um, policies that are coming forward uh, to restrict tobacco use in different settings in laundromats and restaurants. Um, but here are the exception that there would be an act to exempt substance abuse and psychiatric patients from uh, prohibition against smoking in hospitals. <clears throat> and this was in Maine. Uh, also, the tobacco companies would give cigarettes to psychiatric facilities. Uh, here it was called Operation Santa Claus, 12,000 cigarettes. Um, it's so kind of unique. And while that might seem like old news, who would ever do that? There's also been recent discussions about giving e-cigarettes to psychiatric facilities uh, as something that, you know, they think might be a good thing. Okay, I showed you what it looks like when patients leave a smoke-free hospital. Um, people aren't gonna live long-term in, in psychiatric hospitals. You want them out in the community. And so what does their community look like? And we did a study to look at the density of tobacco retailers and the proximity of tobacco retailers uh, to those participants in our studies. And what we found is that those with um, mental illness, they had much more dense environments of tobacco retailers. Uh, they also had a median of three retailers within 500 meters and 12 within a kilometer. Uh, this is San Francisco, the map, and the darker the shading, the more tobacco retailers, each dot is a residence, the white circles are um, kind of group homes. And then we also saw the associations between the, um, the, the, the greater the density, the greater the symptoms of psychosis and self-harm and interpersonal problems, as well as nicotine dependence. Um, and then also the greater the density, the lower self-efficacy, their belief in their ability to quit and their motivation to quit. Uh, there have been some efforts to address this issue of the intersection of smoking and mental illness, some counter-marketing efforts, and super innovative. I love these posters, um, but it's hard to make a dent in um, what's out there in the environment compared to the funding of the tobacco industry. So the tobacco industry outspends the states 18 to 1 in, in marketing of tobacco. This was an um, opportunity I had to work with the CDC on, with their tips campaign to do a, um, a media piece on an individual who had quit smoking and who had depression. Uh, her story is, is Rebecca. And we looked at how um, Rebecca's ad impacted those uh, individuals who had um, identified with mental illness uh, compared to the general population. And we found a nice kind of matching effect there that those um, here who are mental health um, had mental illness, uh, were exposed to tobacco, um, Rebecca tips ads at a greater level, uh, they were more likely to make a quit attempt in the past three months when we surveyed them. 
Whereas those without mental illness, um, their effect was largely seen with the non-Rebecca ads. Uh, and then similarly, intention to quit was greater among those who had mental health concerns and who had greater um, exposure to the Rebecca ads. All right, I'm gonna move now into kind of where the patient treatment in the clinic kind of work. Tons of research, randomized controlled trials on helping people quit smoking. However, very few done, less than 30 uh, for those with mental illness. This was a, um, a literature scoping review that I was part of um, out of um, Australia, the team did that, and um, Dr. Mency, and very few studies, only 18, uh, but you know, at least it's growing, but still 21 total uh, that she identified uh, in that review in terms of randomized controlled trials. The quit line, we heard um, great work this morning about quit line and how it can be effective at a population level. Um, it does work for those with depression, just at a lower level, uh, the study found compared to those without depression. And then Aaron Rogers group um, in New York uh, did a uh, quit line enhanced for those with mental illness and showed a boost in the quitting 26% compared to the um, standard quit line services. Uh, this is the work when we went back into the inpatient psych setting and we offered tobacco cessation treatment in on the unit and then once patients left, uh, we found that we were able to help patients quit smoking over time out to 20% at 18 months um, compared to about 8% in the usual care group. Uh, and this was CO um, uh, confirmed tobacco quit rates. We also found that we didn't hurt mental health recovery. Um, we actually saw greater rehospitalizations in the control group than in the tobacco treatment group, and that the treatment was very cost effective. It was, it was very standard treatments, motivationally based, uh, nicotine patch, and a print manual, um, and very brief counseling that we provided. So, um, not a huge investment in time or money. We took that model to San Francisco General Hospital. Neil mentioned that that's the hospital that Neil's based at. And we replicated the findings in the county um, uh, population, which is much more diverse. Uh, we focused in on those who were duly diagnosed in that sample, and we showed uh, comparable quit rates um, relative to the general sample, uh, and again, a significant effect for the treatment group relative to the usual care. We then took it to the this, this same model to um, a hospital in the, in the Berkeley area, Stanford Hospital and UCSF, a larger sample. We wanted to see if there was differential quit rates by diagnosis and if we could improve our quit rates with um, more intensive treatment, longer use of NRT and some counseling. Uh, we found that most patients are receptive to using nicotine patch on the hospital unit. Um, very few refused. Um, and then those, and that most people wanted to use the patch to um, once they left. And we were combining in the study patch plus gum or lozenge to do the best uh, practice for combination NRT. Uh, if they got NRT, they requested it and got it, they're more likely to make a 24 quit attempt and they're more likely to be quit uh, at one week. And then these are the quit rates over time. Um, the two treatment groups are comparable to each other and they significantly outperform the usual care group. Further, we didn't see in the treatment group uh, differential effects by diagnosis. Uh, so even among those with psychosis, which you might consider kind of the most um, challenging group to work with, um, very um, comparable quit rates. And so nice too that we see replication across the different uh, groups. This um, was the insured um, inpatient setting, the, the county hospital, this most recent study, uh, Sharon Hall has done fantastic work with depressed patients and then also comparing it to what's been seen in general population with these kinds of treatments. Uh, taking it outside of my lab, um, Miles McFall has done fantastic work with patients with PTSD and integrating tobacco treatment into PTSD care and showing a twofold increase in quitting. This is a very large study across multiple sites with the VA. It also was shown to be cost effective. Uh, these are data looking at um, Bernie Clean, um, Eden Evans led this trial, looking at uh, within different diagnostic categories, how did Bernie Clean do relative to propion, the patch, or placebo, um, the blue, bar, blue bars being um, Bernie Clean and showing some significant effects there for all groups and very low levels of um, adverse events. Uh, Eden did another study that looked at longer term treatment of Veroniclean and showed even um, higher quit rates over time. This was 52 weeks of Veroniclean, uh, showing 30% abstinence out at week 76. 
Uh, bupropion also been shown to be effective for helping individuals with schizophrenia to quit smoking. And I'm just going to wrap things up with a policy nod. Um, increasing price, uh, we see that those with mental illness are responsive uh, and reduce their smoking and are more likely to quit. This is um, Michael Ong's work. Um, banning smoking in restaurants and bars, we see lower smoking prevalence for men with alcohol use disorders, among women with anxiety disorders. There was not an effect for individual, individuals with mood disorders. This is uh, work that Kelly Youngwolf and others have done. And then I only will pause here because I think Jennifer Tidy is going to be talking about her innovative work this afternoon. Um, but Neil talked a great deal also about nicotine reduction. Uh, nicotine reduction also shows to have um, powerful effects among ind individuals with mental illness, smoking fewer cigarettes, um, not hurting depressive symptoms, uh, and very little evidence of uh, compensatory smoking. And Steve Higgins has done this work as well. So why the high prevalence of smoking am among those with mental illness? Is it the diagnosis, the environment, the product, the market, regulatory environment? Is it the failure to treat? I would say yes, it's all of those things. Uh, is it ine inevitable? I would say no. Uh, here are some you know, quick things I'll just list out. What can you do? Ban the sale of menthol tobacco, raise tobacco taxes, prohibit tobacco retailers uh, in close proximity to mental health treatment settings adopt smoke-free air laws in mental health treatment settings, use counter-marketing like the, like the TIPS campaign, incorporate tobacco treatment into mental health professional training, create the counter-marketing, um, um, include behavioral health populations in tobacco treatment trials, integrate tobacco cessation into mental health treatment, integrate mental health consults into quit lines, require addiction graphic warnings, and reduce nicotine to minimally or non-addictive levels. Thank you. Thanks so much for that talk. Uh, great overview of mental health and smoking cessation. If you have questions for Dr. Jody Pertreska, please enter them in the Q&A and uh, we can get to those after all the speakers are done. So next up, I will introduce uh, Dr. Danielle McCarthy, who will be speaking today about smoking cessation reach and effectiveness. Dr. McCarthy is currently a professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, where she serves as Associate Director for Research at the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention. Dr. McCarthy leads a program of research focused on the development, refinement, and implementation of treatments to help people stop smoking cigarettes. As part of this research program, she studies the psychological changes that people experience leading up to and during an attempt to quit smoking and ways in which treatments affect those experiences. This is a topic I'm, I'm personally very interested in, so uh, very much looking forward to this talk. Um, Dr. McCarthy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, very kind introduction, and I'm sharing my slides, I hope. Um, let me know when you can see them. Got them. Are they, are they visible to you? They are. Excellent. Great. So today I'm going to be talking with you about uh, a recent review of um, how we're doing in smoking cessation treatment in terms of reach and effectiveness. We've already heard a bit about this today, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time recovering ground that uh, the previous speakers have already covered it in, in such a uh, fantastic fashion. Um, this paper is available, um, and it was written with my um, collaborator, Dr. Baker. We do have some disclosures. We've both been NIH funded. We've also both been investigators on an NIH funded trial that was recently concluded in which Pfizer donated active and placebo varenicline. Um, Dr. Baker's also consulted with the National Cancer Institute regarding its suite of digital smoking cessation tools. Uh, and we will talk about digital interventions a little bit. And I want to give a special acknowledgement to um, particular colleagues, uh, Dan Bolt, Stephen Smith, and Wendy Theobald, but everybody at the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention who has been instrumental in the work will um, present. First, I just want to take a moment to just celebrate where we are and how far we've come. Um, you know, tobacco control is one of the top 10 public health achievements. It's a fantastic case study in how to use policy in particular to improve public health. Um, and that's both in the United States and globally. There are a lot of triumphs to celebrate. 
um, here. Uh, you know, the prevalence we've already seen um, of uh, cigarette use has fallen dramatically. Um, we've seen the ratio of, of people who've ever smoked who have now quit uh, now exceeds 50% and has for several years. That is really exciting. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 million people in the U.S. still smoking. Um, so what's responsible for that? Uh, some other people have done some really nice analyses that point to policy change as the as the most powerful lever in those uh, improvements. Um, things like indoor air laws, taxation policies, um, a whole host of policy intervention efforts um, have made huge changes. We have also made great strides in identifying evidence-based cessation therapies, and we have done some terrific work in, in going beyond the old face-to-face -face group cessation treatment model to innovative um, population level approaches like quit lines, like digital and mobile health interventions, uh, and also changing from reactive to proactive treatment models so that treating tobacco will become the default. And I think we heard about some exciting uh, potential innovations to advance this work earlier today. So really a lot of good news stories for sure. And yet, it's still the leading cause of death, illness, and impoverishment um, in, in a global sense. It's so preventable, and it's still continuing to cause so much disease, distress, and death. Um, this is a, a, a screenshot from the World Health Organization, where they have an AI uh, bot who will serve as a quit coach and try to connect you, set a quit date with you, and s set you up with resources. So. It's also an example of uh, a dissemination outlet that we've, uh, the world has developed to address this problem. So we've made a lot of strides in smoking cessation interventions, but we are crippled by the very low reach that they have. Even though we have quit lines available in every state and territory in the US, their population reach is low. Um, we also know that even the most effective treatments still have relapse rates that are unacceptably high and that remain high for even years after treatment uh, has been completed. And we think that one of the critical limiters in our um, advancement in this area is that we know so little about how treatments are work and therefore how to refine how well they work and how best to use them. That is the best um, use strategies that could maximize their potency and impact. So what we're gonna do today is um, go through this grading rubric. Where are we um, in terms of pharmacotherapy treatments and psychosocial treatments when we evaluate them in terms of reach, effectiveness, what we know about their mechanisms of action at a psychological and behavioral level, and what we know to enhance treatment planning and matching. So this is the rubric we'll be using. So let's start with REACH. We can say REACH, you know, the pupil is definitely trying, but ne we need to improve. Dr. Benowitz already talked about the high level of interest and potential demand for treatment in the population in the US. The vast majority of people who smoke say they wanna quit and more than half make a quit every year these days. Um, so that's a lot of people who are trying to make this change, but they're doing it without assistance by and large. A small minority use medication, and medication without counseling is not what we would recommend. We would recommend at least some behavioral support to go with that medication, um, but rates of using that kind of psychosocial support are just persistently low, um, and we see that only 5% of people who are making quit attempts are using both psychosocial and pharmacotherapy treatments. So we definitely have a lot of room to improve in terms of reach, and here are some things that may help with this. Um, health system changes that better integrate this um, as the default uh, and make it really easy for health system uh, and health system, health care deliverers to um, take a few moments to connect someone with evidence-based treatment. We've done uh, cluster randomized clinical trials that show that uh, building this into the electronic health record so that you can e-refer a patient to the quit line with just a few clicks does in fact enhance the reach of treatment even though there's still considerable fall off between that referral and the connection between the patient and the quit line. 
there's definitely promise for um, digital and mobile interventions. Uh, not only that there's interest out there, but um, that there can be evidence-based strategies to make them effective and engaging and attractive. Um, opt out approaches show tremendous promise where you periodically reach out to a panel of patients enrolled in a health system or maybe even um, clients in a community social service agency and let them know hey we've got treatment would you like to be treated right now that can be effective in bringing people into treatment and using um, innovative strategies to connect people with treatment immediately, and digital tools could play a, a, an important role here so that we do address that challenge that we are seeing um, grow in quitline services where the connection rates among those who've been referred and those who ultimately enroll in services have been falling. And maybe a warm handoff where the connection to the service delivery um, app or program is immediate would help with that. We've also done some work and others have done really impressive work using incentives to try to um, attract people to treatment and keep them engaged in treatment in addition to trying to incentivize abstinence per se. Media campaigns can also have a big impact. We see that quitline promotion works. We see um, that when there's investment in this, that we can drive up reach. It is a malleable um, behavior. The demand is malleable. And I suspect we'll hear more about this from Dr. Carpenter in a few moments, but you know, another way to expand our reach is to not predicate the notion that to be treated, you need to be ready to quit within 30 days, but say, if you're willing to make any change in your smoking, then we have something to offer you and come on in and give it a try and let's see where you go. So motivation phase treatment is another potential, um, potentially exciting, um, impactful way to enhance reach. So here are our reach grades. So for pharmacotherapy, we're doing a bit better. About one in three are using pharmacotherapy, not necessarily in the optimal way, but they're using it. But with psychosocial treatments, even though we have this fantastic network of quit lines, we have this growing body of digital tools, we're still reaching too few of the people who want to quit. So now let's talk about effectiveness, and we're going to focus on pharmacotherapy for a little bit. I mean, tremendous progress here, right? We've got seven first-line medications that we know work better than nothing or better than placebo. Um, we have some comparative effectiveness evidence that's rigorous and um, sufficient to help us recommend um, first-line treatments that we think are more efficacious than monotherapies, although there have been some notable failures to replicate that, including a big trial that came out of our group with over a thousand participants that did not show differential abstinence rates in patch-only combination NRT or varenicline-treated groups, um, but did show highly differential adherence, such that the adherence was much better for the simplest regimen, just wearing a patch every day, was worse for taking two pills a day, and wor was worst for taking wearing a patch and using nicotine lozenges at least five to nine a day. Um, and so maybe the differential um, adherence undercuts the um, greater potency of the enhanced treatments and they end up kind of in the same place. So this is something that I think merits further investigation and watching at the population level. In terms of some of the challenges we face in terms of pharmacotherapy effectiveness, adherence continues to be a major problem. And I think that this is where we're all excited about the potential for e-cigarettes to be um, a much more attractive and sticky substitute relative to our medicinal nicotine um, if, you know, it, with a harm reduction lens. Um, but, you know, Moving adherence is challenging. Um, there are some ways to do it, but it doesn't always translate into um, big enough gains to push abstinence rates up. And then there is this disconnect between the solid clinical evidence that says, yes, these treatments work. They um, work better than placebo. They work better than other active treatments. And then what is the population impact of these? And um, uh, Levy and colleagues and um, others have shown that we really can't attribute a, too much of the progress that has been made to treatment effectiveness because um, the treatments are so 
uh, low in their reach. It's just not the main reason that we've seen the progress that we've had. And when we look at population studies and we survey people and say, how did you quit? What did you use? We can't see the treatment signal um, that we see in clinical trials. And there could be lots of reasons for this. Maybe the people who have the highest risk are the ones most likely to seek out treatment. And so, um, you know, they're already predisposed toward relapse. Maybe people remember failed attempts where they use medication more than they remember failed attempts when they don't. And so that recall bias leads to um, a weakening of the association between medication and successful quitting. So, you know, there are lots of potential reasons for this and things that we need to overcome to um, uh, achieve a detectable and sustained impact of treatments on uh, population level um, abstinence. Another promising approach um, that we could use to maybe enhance pharmacotherapy effectiveness, but don't have enough evidence to say for sure that this is a, the way to go yet, is to um, expand our targets for cessation pharmacotherapy so we're less narrowly focused on the cessation phase and we're expanding the window for pharmacotherapy um, to motivation phases, preparation phases, maintenance phases. Um, and there is some signal in the literature that each of these can work. Um, the effects are generally modest in size, um, and we're not yet sure how best to build a complete suite of cessation pharmacotherapies that would hit all the target phases in an optimal way to yield the, the highest sustained abstinence rates. And chronic care approaches are a little bit different in the sense that that's sort of building in a systems approach so that if a person relapses, you build in a system to encourage them to re-engage with treatment, to recycle quickly, and to try again. Um, and those have shown some promise in re-engaging people. The abstinence uh, yield has not been fantastic yet, but I think that's a really promising direction. So in terms of um, cessation uh, medication effectiveness, we're going to give that a pretty good grade. Still room for improvement, but man, we've made a lot of progress and um, we need to scale it up to the population level. So what do we know about how medications achieve their um, benefits in terms of abstinence? Well, we know a fair bit. We know that um, uh, medications tend to improve craving reduction and uh, reduce reward from smoking. Dr. Benowitz presented some of that work earlier. Also reducing um, traditional withdrawal symptoms, but also anhedonia, which is a more um, a newer kid in the withdrawal syndrome um, that we've now we now know independently predicts difficulty quitting above and beyond the other withdrawal symptoms uh, that can be improved by active treatments. Um, but our models of how these treatments work are challenged by some of the nonspecific effects that we're seeing. So we did a trial of bupropion versus placebo, and what we found significantly mediated its benefits was a little bit of craving reduction, reduction a little bit of affect modulation, but also these nonspecific effects of greater confidence and greater motivation. And you know, blinding people to medication condition is, is difficult and doesn't happen in the real world. And maybe there are some non-specific drivers of these effects that we should consider, take into account, and maybe find ways to capitalize on. So we know something about how pharmacotherapies help people quit. So we'll give ourselves a pretty good grade here. And um, Dr. Benowitz just talked about this work, so I'm not gonna review it in detail, but we are learning how we might be able to match people to treatments so as to maximize their odds of working for those individuals. I think that's super exciting. But as Dr. Benowitz mentioned, this isn't really in real world use yet. We don't know what kind of potential population impact this has. We don't know what kind of system changes we need to, to bring this to people in a useful way. Um, but we know that in principle, we've identified some matching variables that could be helpful um, to use precision medicine to improve the uh, effectiveness of cessation pharmacotherapy and that's very exciting. So early stages, you know, we haven't linked this to population impact yet either, but, but great promise. And what I want to focus on for the rest of the time is psychosocial treatment. We clearly know that counseling is better than no counseling, that even as little as 10 minutes of counseling can significantly increase the odds that you're going to quit successfully and it can 
be delivered in different formats and modalities from different kinds of care providers and it it seems clear and robust that it works. The effect sizes are not huge. They tend to be in the small to moderate range, a little bit smaller if they're adjunctive to medications, um, but still significant um, benefit. There does seem to be a dose response relationship to a point, it sort of, you know, uh, plateaus at some point, um, and much more intense treatment doesn't seem to be that much better than lower intensity treatment but there is a little bit of a dose response relationship at least. So that's great, right? The dominant model that is disseminated through quit lines, through accredited tobacco treatment specialist training programs, um, and that's sort of the bread and butter of smoking cessation counseling is rooted in cognitive behavior therapy, sometimes called coping training. We are gonna call it skills training. Um, and you know, the, kind of some of the key things are you're gonna identify uh, triggers for smoking. You're going to help people actively avoid those and proactively cope with them uh, or reactively cope as needed. Um, so this is great. It's grounded in behavioral research and, and theory. Um, and this has been our dominant model. There are some newer kids on the block who seem to have similar effectiveness like acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and there was a recent trial, in fact, of an, the ACT app versus the NCI app that suggested it might outperform the more traditional skills training um, NCI app. Um, but when we look a little bit deeper, and this is just uh, five randomized clinical trials of skills training versus uh, active controls from, a, you know, a, a, um, older studies, but also some more recent ones. Um, and they're, you know, fairly good sized studies, moderate sample sizes. When you look in the right hand column, ST is for skills training and C is for control. These are five well conducted rigorous studies that fail to show a benefit of skills training over an active control. And so it's not just one study. These are, you know, rigorous studies with seven day point prevalence abstinence. Uh, three of them were biologic or biochemically confirmed. Um, and it's not like it's, well, you know, there's a signal there. You're just underpowered to see them. No, it's just not going in that direction, really. Um, and so how do we account for this? What do we think is going on that here we have these multiple trials that fail to show that skills training outperforms uh, basically attention matched controls. Um, and maybe these treatments don't work the way they, we think they do. And I'm gonna return to that idea in a moment, um, but that's the, the working hypothesis that I come away from that with. Um, there are some really exciting innovations in psychosocial treatment strategies that I think are um, very promising and worthy of um, more investigation. And that includes the use of incentives in creative ways, not just to consequate um, incentive of delivery on abstinence, um, but intermediate steps like initiating treatment and continuing to use treatment and um, a large study, two large studies that have been done out of our group have shown that if you offer incentives for completing treatment visits, the number of treatment visits go up and that that mediates um, later improvements in abstinence. Digital interventions clearly are very promising and to the extent, um, as Dr. Sheffer um, suggested, they can be grounded in theory um, and really informed by what we're learning about how behavior change happens and how to support it, that would um, be terrific and could um, improve the potency of digital interventions. So far, there's great potential for reach. The effect sizes seem modest, which is not surprising because they are generally light touch kinds of interventions, although the potential for them to become more engaging and more robust, I think is tremendous. There is a, a strong need for um, rigorous trials in this area for sure. So, what can we do to build better psychosocial treatments um, that will have greater potency? And I, I do want, I've been talking about reach and effectiveness as though they're separate, but I do want to highlight that it may be that um, highly effective treatments would just naturally draw more people to them. It's a little bit hard to sell a treatment when you can say, well, there, you know, about one in two or three people, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> two or to three out of 10 people um, who use this treatment will quit. Um, 
if we were able to say, yeah, 70% of people who use this treatment um, quit, that could draw uh, more people to it. So I think we need to do a better job of identifying what are the key active components in our smoking cessation counseling interventions because they typically involve multiple components and we don't know which ones are potent, which ones are distractors, which ones just make it less efficient. Um, we don't know yet how to build packages with components that are going to have additive or synergistic effects, although some of the work coming out of the Truth Initiative um, that Dr. Graham has published suggests that there are ways to do that with particular features of digital interventions. I think that's terribly exciting and, and um, reason for hope that we can build these um, really efficient, effective pack patches packages, and we need more comparative effectiveness research among psychosocial treatments. So, and then we have this um, challenge. There are a few studies that we've done out of our group that um, use a factorial design to try to identify the potent components and the most promising combinations of components that you can put together to build the most effective um, smoking cessation treatment package. And all of these three studies were factorial studies. Two of them were two to the fifth um, factorial studies, and one was a, a, a two to the fourth factorial study. They all included medication components and psychosocial components. In all three of these studies, in a paper that Tim and Dan Bolt and Stephen Smith just published, um, what you see is that the main effects are all positive. Every component has um, a positive overall main effect. And all of the interactive effects are negative. They're sub-additive. And the more you turn, uh, you, the more components you turn on, the less um, efficiency you're getting, right? The less benefit you're getting. In fact, you're just seeing that you're kind of chipping away at the effectiveness of the treatment. And so what is going on there? Um, this is really, um, this could be happening in all of our multi-component treatments and we don't know it. We only can see it when we pull it apart in a dismantling study like uh, or um, a factorial design or the like. Um, and this is just one of the studies. And here are what the components looked like in the Fraser et al. study. Um, so we had, um, we manipulated the content of the website. We um, had motivational emails either on or off. We had quit line calls either on or off. We had, we manipulated the content of a self-help booklet. And then we either had medication on or off. And the more components you turned on, the less benefit you got from that. Um, and it may be that when you give people so many different things, you're increasing burden on them um, and they're gonna adhere less to each component because now they're distributing their effort more broadly or they're just overwhelmed and they're withdrawing. It may, and we did see some evidence of that when you turn the email messages on, people logged onto the website less, um, which is not what we wanted to see. Um, and it ended up uh, showing, uh, consecrating um, lower abstinence rates down the, the road, which was not great. It also could be that all these treatments are too similar. They're, they're offering content that's, that overlaps too much. And the more similar components do have greater sub-additivity than like a medication and a psychosocial treatment. So that's, there's some support for that hypothesis. And the last possibility is or at least that we came up with, was that maybe some people are really close to the tipping point of quitting and they just need any one component to get over the peak and on the other side. Whereas other people are starting way down at the bottom of the, the slope. And even if you give them five components, they're gonna end up just short of the peak and they're not gonna get to the tipping point. All of those things could be contributing to this sub-additivity, but it's a major problem that we need to address. So um, we have a lot of room for improvement in terms of psychosocial treatment effectiveness. Um, mechanisms. I talked about how important we think that is. Well, we don't have compelling evidence that our psychosocial treatments that are trying to impart skills to people really do um, result in acquisition of those skills. Um, application of those skills in the situations in which they're needed or protection when those skills are applied. We just don't know that our treatments are affecting the behaviors we're targeting and that that is protective. Um, it, 
when we have looked at how our psychosocial treatments compared to attentional controls, we have not found that we have uh, affected the targets that we most uh, wanted to target and that were most predictive of abstinence. So a lot of work there. Uh, to do. And it, just one more mention about treatment planning and matching. Um, I think all of our treatments right now are designed with some uh, to permit tailoring to an individual's triggers, values, motives, social support, um, availability. Um, there's evidence that personalization of digital interventions may augment um, in a synergistic way the effects of other um, intervention features. That's super exciting. Um, but we don't yet have the equivalent of the genotypes that we have for pharmacotherapy in terms of treatment matching and precision medicine for psychosocial treatment. So there's some room for improvement there too. So we have a lot to celebrate. We've made incredible progress. We cannot attribute most of that progress to treatment, and we have a lot of treatment work left to do in terms of enhancing reach, enhancing effectiveness, better integrating our theory and applications. We have a tremendous opportunity to do that with digital interventions and to specify and test mechanisms of change in exciting ways and advance our knowledge so that we can um, refine treatments. And as other speakers have acknowledged, we also have to be aware of the proliferating um, products out there, uh, marijuana use, and changes in the way that people connect with care phone is going out, texting is coming in, what are we going to do about that and how can we evaluate that? So thank you. Um, I appreciate your attention. Thanks so much for that presentation. Uh, I covered a lot of ground there in 30 minutes. Uh, it's a great comprehensive overview. I will now move on to our next speaker. Um, Next up is Dr. Matt Carpenter, who received his PhD right here at the University of Vermont in clinical psychology. And uh, we actually share a graduate school mentor, Dr. John Hughes, uh, attended a few years after, after Matt here at UVM. And after Matt graduated in 2003, he relocated to the Medical University of South Carolina, where he completed his internship and postdoctoral training he joined the MUSC faculty in 2006 and is currently a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Dr. Carpenter is jointly affiliated with the Addiction Sciences Division within the Department of Psychiatry and the Hollings Cancer Center, where he serves as co-leader of the Cancer Control Program and co-director of the Tobacco Research Program. His primary research interests relate to tobacco use across a broad methodological continuum from lab-based studies of craving and nicotine um, to, uh, to, back to uh, craving nicotine dependence and clinical trials from smoking cessation to public health policy for effective tobacco control. So Matt will be talking today about medication sampling and smoking cessation. Uh, very much looking forward to this talk. So the stage is yours, Matt. Thanks. Great, great. Eli, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. And you can see my slides. Yes. Very good. Well, that was a great presentation from Danielle, and it could not have been perfect, more perfectly timed in front of me because I'll be talking about uh, reach uh, with, with almost without even saying it. Um, so uh, I'm happy to be here today, and I thank you all for the invitation to uh, come back to Vermont, so to speak. Um, so um, a couple of disclosures before I get started. Uh, I have received uh, honoraria from Pfizer for some consulting in the past few years. Uh, I've received uh, other consulting uh, honoraria. I did also receive uh, medication supply and um, uh, study support for a pilot study that I will be mentioning uh, later in this presentation. So I'm gonna cut right to the chase um, and talk uh, right about uh, medication sampling. And I think this will make sense to everybody uh, quite um, quickly. So medication sampling is exactly what it sounds like. It's providing a short course. Uh, we've done two, three, four, six weeks of one or more cessation medications with minimal instructions to quit and without any firm commitment to quit. So um, it's an it's a often overused analogy, but I, it, I find that it works in many of my presentations around this theme. Uh, you go to your dentist and you leave your dentist with a little bag um, and the bag has a uh, little um, toys and tricks in it that you should be going back for your uh, go home and using to uh, further promote your oral health. 
well, why can't we be doing the same thing for smoking cessation where we uh, very simply and very um, non-instructively give out uh, products to help smokers quit? It's concrete, it's behavioral, it's immediately actionable. I can go home and use it that day if I want to. And if you follow the major theories of change, it's a cue to action. So we've used many metaphors over the years, and here's a few. Um, there's all kinds of metaphors that might work in this situation. So we've done several studies of medication sampling um, uh, of NRT, nicotine replacement. Uh, and I'm only going to talk about the third one, which was our biggest one and our most applied one. So um, uh, this was a cluster randomized clinical trial that we did in primary care settings ar around the state of South Carolina. Uh, we internally called this the tip top study and you could see the um, what the acronym stands for there. Um, uh, I have found that when you do these trials, it's helpful to get a logo uh, and, and put a face on it, so to speak. So this was 22 sites across South Carolina, uh, 12 in standard care or uh, 10 that receive standard care plus nicotine replacement uh, uh, samples. All of the procedures, screening, consenting, baseline assessment, treatment delivery, all of that was done by clinic staff. We did not embed anybody in any clinic. So really the, the standard care was what, as the uh, providers uh, normally did, uh, hopefully following USPHS guidelines, which we did give them a reminder about at the outset of the study, to, you know, the five A's and those types of things. Um, and uh, all providers in all clinics were encouraged to deliver cessation as it they would typically do. And everybody gave out a baggie to all smokers in their clinics uh, with cessation materials, uh, brochures, uh, information about the quit line, etc. And then for half the people, for roughly half the clinics, there was a two-week supply of uh, both nicotine patch and lozenge in there. 1,245 adult smokers. We had very broad inclusion criteria. Um, most notably, we did not require a motivation to quit. We did assess it. Uh, there was no requirement that you had to use it, the meds. Um, uh, it was really just a, a hands-off experience. And then we followed everybody up through six months, and that was done centrally through our research uh, team here at uh, MUSC. So uh, cut right to the outcomes. This, these are the main outcomes that we published. I guess it's almost been about a year and a half now, a little bit more um, in addiction. And from right, from, sorry, from left to right, we have a uh, quit attempt within a one month, any quit attempt at all in six months, any 24 hour quit attempt, and then point prevalence abstinence. These are self-reported abstinence rates, seven day non-smoking, not even a puff, over one, three, and six months, and then if they ever achieved seven days in a row of non-smoking, which we have been calling floating absence. It could float anywhere in that six-month outcome period. So you'll notice that the uh, raw outcomes are not very uh, high. Uh, this is a low-touch uh, intervention. We're not expecting uh, great absence rates, uh, but this is about reach, um, and you can see uh, the bolded Odds ratios uh, is where we reach statistical significance. Uh, what was surprising to us is that the effects um, increased over time. Uh, the abstinence rates increased over time. Uh, and in all cases, almost all cases, the, uh, the uh, outcomes were favorable in the NRT sampling group, uh, if numerically, if not statistically. Uh, you know, these are you know, small effect sizes, but again, this is really about reach. What we then did was the subset analyses. We took our folks who said at baseline, I do not really have strong interest in quitting smoking in the next 30 days, low motivation to quit. And then compared them to the folks who said, yeah, I, I really do want to quit smoking, the high motivation group. So three things I'd want you to note as noted down below. All of these subgroup comparisons are non-significant. We weren't powered on these effects. The absolute outcomes, the percentages, are higher in the high motivation group. So for example, let's just take a look at, say, uh, abstinence at six months. The, um, the NRT group in the high motivation group is 15% versus low motivation group NRT, 8%. So you're going to find higher raw outcomes in the um, higher motivation group. But interestingly enough, at least to us, is that the effect sizes 
uh, were comparable or if not higher among those who reported low motivation to quit at baseline. And this is important because if all we do at the end of the day is help the folks who already are, are at there, uh, are at the point of wanting to quit, then uh, in my opinion, we haven't really done a, a great job. You know, we, we've helped the people who are already ready to go. But, you know, can we, can this sampling experience stir the pot, so to speak, get the unmotivated people going? And I think it does. So I, I'm sorry for the uh, fuzziness of the picture. It's a little bit enlarged, but we then uh, did another interesting analysis uh, along common disparity groups. So I've got four panels that I'm gonna show you. Uh, here is any medication use and any 24 hour quit attempt. Again, many of these outcomes, these odds ratios, uh, which compare the NRT sampling versus the non-NRT sampling groups. Um, many of these odds ratios are non-significant, but you will see that NRT sampling uh, if anything, had uh, higher effects among people who have, uh, who are more underserved, if you will. So for example, if you just take a look at any medication use, um, those who had lower education, the, uh, the effect of, of NRT sampling was, um, was, was greater than it was for people who had um, uh, higher levels of, of, of education. So we, we are, this is a, an intervention that is uh, tar not targeting, but it is helping uh, folks who are at lower disparate groups uh, compared to uh, those who are, are not. And now we have floating abstinence on the left and point prevalence abstinence on the right. And again, um, you see uh, 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 stronger effects, if you will, among uh, those who in, in, in underserved populations. So for as one quick example, take a look to your bottom right. Uh, NRT sampling uh, had a larger effect size an odds ratio around two for those smokers who came from uh, very much urb rural areas, excuse me. Whereas uh, the effect size for NRT sampling compared to not was lower among those who came from urban areas, low rurality. Now, that led to the question is, okay, we, we've got this intervention, it's, it's easy to deliver, it, it basically takes a minute, you hand the bag over, you might, you know, hopefully say something about it, we encourage you to use these, et cetera, et cetera, but it's very simple to use, and it doesn't cost much at all, right? So that led to questions about um, uh, cost effectiveness, which I've been wondering about. Now, if you're like me, you, didn't, you don't know a whole lot about cost effectiveness, so I had to take a little crash course on this myself. And if you want to take a one paper reading, crash course reading of, of cost effectiveness, uh, here's one by Cohen and Reynolds, which I found to be very um, uh, user friendly and accessible for the, for the non expert in this area. So uh, they talk about four quadrants of, um, uh, uh, of cost effectiveness. Most usually, um, you know, costs are either increasing or uh, while uh, efficacy is also increasing or costs are decreasing while e efficacy is also decreasing. So in that upper right and upper left, uh, lower left quadrant, that's where the cost effectiveness ratio really has to get um, calculated and then interpreted. And there's whole kinds of ways to interpret the cost effectiveness ratio. But in rare cases, you find it to be the case that uh, the cost is increasing and the efficacy is going down. That's a bad thing, right? Because uh, it, it would be said that your intervention, your novel intervention is being dominated. Another rare situation is where you are both uh, decreasing the cost and you are increasing the efficacy and there your intervention would be dominant. And according to these folks, uh, both dominated and dominant uh, interventions are fairly rare, but here we are. So in our study where it was one and done, we gave out one sample of, of NRT versus not, and the NRT samples were basically $75. Yes, there were other things in the bag, but there, that was comparable to what was in the standard care group. We gave out a two week supply of patch and lozenge, $75 ish. Uh, so I won't get into the meat of the numbers here, but NRT sampling is dominant. What happens if you give it out more than once? 
So we did a modeling uh, 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 exercise. Our, my colleague at the University of South Carolina, no relationship to the Medical University of South Carolina, Brian Chen, a cost effectiveness expert, modeled what it would look like if NRT sampling were given out twice or uh, twice over six months um, or, or, or uh, to half the smokers. And then if half the smokers were given it again each quarter over 12 months. Okay, and you could see again that the cost the cost of the product goes up, but the discounted cost of subsequent health care is 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 going down further, not by much, but it is going down. And then uh, you can look at it as compared to discounted quality adjusted life years. Again, I'm not an expert in this area, but when you know this compared to that tutorial that I showed you to a slide ago, um, NRT sampling is dominant, and that caught our attention. This is in review right now. Then we play, played with the parameters a little bit. Uh, okay, so uh, the only parameter that we played found in which NRT sampling would not be dominant is if it had no uh, efficacy at all. So if if the if if the NRT sampling dropped to eight percent in efficacy, and basically came to the uh, equal that of um, uh, standard care. Well, in that case. Obviously, uh, you're increasing cost, but you're not increasing efficacy, and um, standard care will always dominate in that case. But if we played around with different uh, outcomes here, what happens if our if our uh, NRT sampling had a higher quit rate? What would happen if the age distribution were younger or older um, as compared to what we had in our study? What would happen if uh, the percentage of males were different or higher or lower? And then what would happen if we found cheaper meds? Or what would happen if we used more expensive meds, gave it out more? Even when you gave, if we estimated that we give out $150, I'm sorry, not $150, but uh, 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 actually it is about $120, I think, $112, excuse me, it's right there. 150% of our cost. Uh, even when you do that, it will still be the case in our forecast that NRT sampling will be dominant. So it's, again, this is about reach and downstream efficacy, a cost of uh, efficacy. Let's switch gears. And so that was a, a trial that we did with NRT. It was very practical. It was very applied in primary care. And now we ask the same questions. Well, can you do this with varenicline? Now, if you ever want to, you know, take on the challenges of navigating uh, difficulties with your IRB, do a remote study of varenicline sampling, because we face a number of challenges in this. But um, what I liked about this question is that I, you know, you can conceivably make an argument that it will not, or might work. So why would I'll start right inside? Well, it's a prescription medication. You need a clinician to oversee the whole thing. I, uh, you know complicated titration instructions. You got to, you know, a uh, certain dosage for a couple of days and ramp up. Um, you know, the whole nature of sampling is that there might be ad libitum use. You might take it Monday, skip Tuesday, come back Wednesday, take it Saturday, et cetera. Does that lead to inactive use? Then there's the enduring questions of safety, uh, which might all make you question whether this thing is even worth testing at all. But if you are like us, we said, eh, let's go for it. So we, uh, we cited you know, the evidence that said this is the best single agent for cessation. Uh, it may eventually go to OTC, who knows. Uh, there are lots of studies that have been shown that varenicline for unmotivated smokers, flexible dosing, pre-quit, all those methodologies are suggestive or help, helpful. And then we all are familiar with the EAGLES trial, uh, demonstrating fairly conclusively, in my opinion, uh, the safety of varenicline. So sure, we thought it was worth testing. So we did a, a pilot study, a uh, remote clinical trial of varenicline sampling versus not on feasibility uptake and outcomes. So this was 99 smokers across the state of South Carolina. Uh, now this is not primary care. This is just a, you know, a community sample of smokers. Um, uh, with, we purposely recruited uh, smokers who did and did not wanna quit. We have stratified randomization for reasons that you'll see in a few moments. We gave folks a one-time supply of 56 tablets, all of which were 0.5 milligrams. And we gave them a, a one-page suggestive guideline on use. And you can see some of the messaging that we had around it. You're not required to use it. 
et cetera, et cetera. So we viewed the sampling experience as lasting two to four weeks, depending on how much they would use it. There's no direct intervention from a clinician, although we do have uh, physician oversight throughout. And then for this pilot study, we only assessed outcomes through 12 weeks of follow-up, uh, uptake, safety, and behavioral outcomes, self-reported uh, changes in, in behavior. Okay, did they use it? Yep, they did. So this is only in the varenicline group only because uh, there was one or two cases of varenicline use in the control group, not worth plotting on a graph. Uh, so in the varenicline group only, um, so you could see the usage, any usage and then daily usage at weeks two and four. And even when the sampling experience was presumably over, and certainly at three months follow-up, a fair number of, of smokers were still using it and a fair number of them were still using it regularly, around 10%. Uh, most fell into a titration pattern of steady users. So we were kind of interested in the sort of the haphazardness, if you will. And most people found a rhythm and, and stuck with it. We were also interested, well, how many of these folks go out and get their own? Okay, it's one thing to give people a two-week supply, but does it lead to downstream use, particularly for a prescription medication? So, um, you know, at week 12, 14% went out and got it on their own. And at three months, almost 60% of these folks went out and got it on their own uh, through various channels, presumably through their primary care provider. Uh, at no time did anybody exceed the recommended uh, dosage, which was two milligrams a day. Here are the changes in motivation to quit and confidence to quit, parallel lines for both uh, across motivation and confidence. Of course, uh, varenicline and control group, uh, comparisons are not parallel. We see motivation and confidence increasing, particularly in the early weeks, and then coming down just a bit thereafter. Changes in cigarette smoking, uh, which represent a seven-day average. You see that um, varenicline uh, users, uh, this is intent to treat, not just varenicline users, but those in the varenicline group uh, had uh, larger reductions in their cigarette smoking. And in fact, more of them reached a 50% reduction uh, in their cigarettes per day uh, since baseline, both at uh, four weeks and at 12 weeks. Uh, this is our, these are our, the abstinence outcomes and the quit attempt outcomes. Interestingly enough, um, well, I mean, very parallel to what I showed you for the NRT. Again, these are non-significant findings. This is a pilot study, but it for, as a pilot study, I focus mostly on effect sizes. And here I see, you know, odds ratios around 1.5 or higher. Uh, you know, two and a half fold increase in abstinence at week 12 or floating abstinence, uh, a greater than three fold uh, increase in floating abstinence as a function of being assigned to the Brennan sampling group. Um, a, a we then stratified this by uh, motivation to quit, just like we did for the NRT studies. And uh, interestingly here is that if you were in the low motivation group, you have higher uh, likelihood of, of, uh, of responding to the varenicline, that is making a quit attempt, than you do uh, to control group. But in terms of the abstinence outcomes, the higher motivation groups had the higher quit rate. So this is a little bit different than what I showed you where, um, for the NRT studies, that low in motivation, low motivation and high motivation had roughly comparable uh, effect sizes across the board. Okay, so varenicline sampling in the context of a remote trial with minimally suggestive guidance on use, basically a one pager, uh, emphasizing a user-driven experience. It's feasible, resulting in strong uptake. Uh, safe. I have not shown you adverse events, but I can tell you that there were no serious ones, and uh, the adverse events that we did see were commensurate with what you'd see uh, in any of the Vernicklin trials. It was beneficial, we think. All cessation-related outcomes were numerically, if not statistically, in favor, and are worth testing in a larger trial, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. So we have ongoing a large study, which we're calling the STAR study. Um, where we're actually putting head-to-head -head Vrenicklin versus NRT versus neither. Uh, this will be another large study and uh, stay tuned for the outcomes of this one in a few years. Okay, so I asked a couple of interesting questions. Now we've got non, we've got two separate studies of Vrenicklin and NRT. And um, 
and, and one ongoing head-to-head -head study. I can't really talk about that just yet, but I can talk about the indirect comparisons between the NRT outcomes and the Varenicline outcomes. So what we did here is kind of pooled everything together. And um, it's a little bit complicated to walk you through this, but uh, let's look at the orange bars first. The orange bars, if you received nothing, this is basically you know, population effects. So if you, if you live with a smoker, you are less likely to make a, um, uh, a quit attempt than if you uh, don't live with a smoker. If you are hi uh, highly motivated to quit, you're more likely to make a quit attempt than if you are low motivated to quit. But now let's layer in the NRT and Varenicline studies, okay? So if you are high motivation to quit, and if you take Varenicline, you have um, uh, much higher um, odds of making a quit attempt than if you are low motivation to quit. So now we're seeing pot potential uh, moderators or even treatment matching, I mean, uh, uh, of, of who might be more responsive to uh, one medication or the other. So um, uh, yeah, and then I've got floating abstinence. Oops, I went to skip one. Uh, how do I go up? That's okay, in the interest of time, I, this is, uh, I'll just go forward. This is point prevalence at the final follow-up. Um, note that whether you use a medication prior, particularly if you use the NRT, uh, you're more likely to be responsive to use Varenicline. Uh, and achieve abstinence as compared to whether you didn't use NRT in the past, okay? So again, don't overinterpret any of these. Um, many of them are non-significant, but I thought this was a, just a nice way to start thinking about, well, who would be, who would want to give what sample to? And again, our ongoing uh, studies will um, answer that more directly. But thinking, uh, I'm wrapping it all up. I think I actually might be making up time. Hopefully that's a good thing. Uh, we know that medication sampling has low quit rates. Not gonna deny that. It will never replace the need for more intensive and sustained treatments. And uh, at least on our studies, uh, it's been constrained by lack of biological verification. I will say that um, it is hard to do biological verification for remote studies. That was particularly the case three to five years ago, that's less the case now. Um, for our ongoing remote trials, whether it's the one I mentioned or others, we are getting um, uh, at least remote CO uh, breath samples. But on the positive side, we can say that medication sampling is likely scalable, pragmatic, and cheap. And as the example that I gave you of handing a bag over basically takes a minute to deliver. Very face valid, doesn't provide, doesn't require a lot of training to the provider who gives it or to the smoker who receives it. It Medication sampling uh, promotes continued use of that products. More, most importantly, it promotes quit attempts and cessation and smoking reduction. It's very lay friendly, perhaps cost-effective and therefore we think super disseminable. So with that, I will close out and say, I uh, just want to acknowledge our funding, uh, my collaborators, some here at MUSC, some throughout the state who I've worked with. Some, some of these folks have now left us. Uh, my, my research staff over the past several years, uh, College of Charleston students, and um, our trainees, uh, some of whom have stayed at MUSC and some of them have moved on elsewhere. So I think my time is up. I'll be happy to take questions uh, later on after Steve. Thanks, Matt, for that wonderful presentation. It's an exciting body of research. Just want to remind everyone to uh, post questions in the Q&A box, and we'll bring those up after uh, this next talk. So next up, I will introduce um, Dr. Stephen Higgins, who you all already have met. Uh, and as you know, he is the director of the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health here at the University of Vermont. He is uh, the principal investigator on five NIH grants on the general topic of behavior and health, including the UVM Center on Center of Biomedical Research Excellence and the Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science. Dr. Higgins is the Virginia H. Donaldson Endowed Professor of Translational Science in the Departments of Psychiatry and Psychological Science and serves as the Vice Chair of Psychiatry at UVM. His research centers around behavioral economics and behavioral pharmacology to investigate tobacco, substance use, and other health 
related risk behaviors in vulnerable populations. Today, I'm looking forward to his talk on some of his groundbreaking work on smoking cessation with pregnant women uh, and financial incentives. So Steve, I'll hand it over to you. Steve, you there? Sounds like you're muted, Steve. All right. Now are we good? Yep, got you now. Can hear you. And Perfect. Thank you. you Thank you, Eli. And it's really a, a, an honor to be on this panel with uh, the other excellent investigators. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed the presentations. So as you can see on my slide here, I'm going to be talking about financial incentives, increasing smoking cessation, improving other maternal infant outcomes among pregnant and newly postpartum women. I have to admit that uh, in a way of a disclosure, I'm one of these guys with this population that I'm not satisfied with the uh, conventional outcomes of we benefit one in 10 people who receive the treatment. So you're going to see I go fairly intensively, and I think, I hope I can justify that. Um, right, so the, um, I'm going to present results um, really from a paper. It's three studies that are being written up together in a paper. It's very interdisciplinary. And these are my co-authors and collaborators. Uh, this is my funding and I have no conflicts of interest to declare nor do any of my co-authors. Um, so the, um, there's broad agreement that smoking during pregnancy is either a leading or the leading preventable cause of poor pregnancy outcomes in the US and other developed countries. It uh, differentially impacts socioeconomically disadvantaged women, uh, especially women who have low educational attainment. Uh, efficacious cessation interventions are widely available, at least at the level of uh, meta-analysis. There are a number of interventions that show efficacy, um, but the antipartum quit rates are unacceptably low. And I say less than 15%, as you'll see in my results, it's often more around that typical 10% or not even below. Um, so usual care is typically a referral to the quit line and virtually every 50, um, all 50 states as we heard this morning um, have a quit line and then best practices uh, includes a follow-up and further referral if the women continue to smoke. Um, there's broad consensus within the community that researches this population or treats this population clinically that, that we need improvements in smoking cessation with them. Um, and so I'll show evidence that financial incentives represent an innovation, and that's what the theme of this conference, that reliably increases quit rates, antipartum and early postpartum. And these are incentives that are contingent on biochemical uh, evidence that the person has abstained. I'm going to trouble advancing my slides here. All right, so um, the three studies, I'm going to present evidence from a randomized controlled trial that I'll refer to as the current trial. And that is a trial that I showed some preliminary results on um, in one of our prior conferences. Um, but now we, we have finished the, uh, the trial and the analyses. Other than we're doing a little bit of fine-tuning fine on our ICERs and the cost-effectiveness analysis. So Matt sent us up, well, I am no expert in this. Or we have health economists helping us. And in rushing to get everything done here, I have partial um, completion of the cost-effectiveness analysis, but not the ICERs. Um, the primary outcome in, the, in our trials is antipartum absence. We're all in and trying to protect the fetus. We are, we're interested in obviously in maternal health as well and maternal long-term absence. But um, what brought us into this field was, was interventions that could uh, help to protect the fetus. Secondary outcomes, uh, craving and withdrawal, birth outcomes, postpartum absence, breastfeeding, infant growth development, cost benefit analysis. And I won't be able to go into the weeds in all these, but um, I will in, in many of them. Um, so the pool data set is we took the trial 
um, involving 169 women that we're referring to as the current trial. And we combine them with four similar randomized control trials, similar in the sense that they use um, either the same in, um, incentive intervention or a slight variation of the incentive model. And, um, but the control can diff condition differed in the prior trials. It was usually a non-contingent incentive condition, which where the, the controls get the same um, vouchers as the um, intervention condition, but independent of their smoking status. And so uh, there were 245 participants in those prior trials. So combined with the current trial, we have 453 participants. So um, we're able to increase our power, but we're really trying to check reliability. This You can think of this as like the final study of these this clinic-based clinic intervention on financial incentives for smoking cessation in pregnant women that we have been working on for almost 20 years. So there are going to be 245 in the incentive condition and 208 controls. And then the third study is we... Um, got a Vermont wide sample to assess the external validity of trial results on uh, two, two features of the trial results. One is the relationship between maternal smoking status, and we are interested in three categories, the women who weren't smoking before the pregnancy nor during the pregnancy, women who smoked uh, early in the pregnancy but quit before the uh, third trimester, and women who smoked into the third trimester or all the way through the pregnancy. And we wanna know how those, um, those smoking statuses relate to small for gestational age birth outcomes and associated healthcare costs. Um, so, okay, who are our participants? We recruit women who are still smoking at their first prenatal care visit from OBGYN clinics in the, uh, uh, Burlington, um, Vermont area, and then also surrounding counties. So Burlington is where the University of Vermont is located. Um, and inclusion criteria that these are uh, people who we biochemically confirm a self-report of smoking at the start of prenatal care. The gestational age is um, less than or equal to 25 weeks, and they plan to be in the, remain in the area for the next uh, 12 months. These are generally applied to across all the trials, but the, the, the duration there is, is the current trial. The exclusion criteria incarceration prior participation in incentives smoke and cessation study residing with the current trial participant, a regular use of opioid stimulant or antipsychotic medications out of concern that um, they can directly influence the reinforcing effects of smoking. We had, um, in the current trial, 584 uh, women started the uh, screening process, 126 failed to complete, 282 were ineligible. The biggest ineligibility criterion was the opioid um, use. And, and we, uh, this population in Vermont's um, population more generally has been heavily impacted by the opioid use disorder. And so we were able to enroll 176 of the women then if we, a third condition we had was a never smoker condition and we screened 759 never smokers, um, 21 failed to complete screening, 657 ineligible. And that was the challenge of trying to match never smokers with smokers on socioeconomic variables. It, it was a struggle. We got through it, but um, it took us a while. And so, and it's not perfect. So the only reason for exclusion once enrolled uh, was abortion or fetal demise, and there were no significant differences over treat, um, the treatment conditions or the uh, never smoker you know, on that variable. All right, so uh, at the intake assessment, participants complete various questionnaires. I'll show you results from the Minnesota Nicotine Withdrawal Questionnaire, but we do a number of them, BDI, examining socio-demographic smoking, psychiatric conditions. Then we also collect baseline breath and urine samples. And then modified versions of this battery get completed um, one month after the intake. We call that the early antepartum assessment. And then at uh, 28 weeks gestation or later, and we call that the late pregnancy assessment. In a lot of ways, like in the Cochrane reviews on this topic, this is like a gold standard outcome, again, with the idea of protecting the fetus. 
And then um, we also do assessments at, at the postpartum assessment periods you see here out through uh, 48 weeks. And at all of them, we're, we're taking breath and urine, uh, breath CO specimens and urine coating. Um, and then birth outcomes are obtained from maternal uh, medical records. All right, so in the trial conditions, all participants assigned to the best practices were encouraged to choose a quit date in the next two weeks. And once they identified a quit date, um, we faxed on their behalf a signed referral uh, to the Vermont quit line. The, our quit, the Vermont quit line is offer, offers perinatal specific brief phone counseling. The um, contractor is National Jewish Health and the uh, quit, the uh, calls are, are handled by a quit coach. There's five available antepartum and four uh, postpartum, and they do counseling based on the stages of change and it includes motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral strategies. They also offer um, incentives to complete calls. And we, we heard some men mention of that in Danielle's presentation. So there was $65. And this, again, this was just through the quit line. Uh, for completing calls in the best practices part of this intervention. They were also eligible for free nicotine replacement if their providers agreed. Um, and then if women, women showed up uh, still smoking at a follow-up assessment, we uh, did a, a follow-up referral to the quit line to um, stick with the best, the best practices um, protocol. And then uh, women assigned to the BP plus financial incentives uh, received the same the same intervention. They were encouraged to pick a Monday quit date in the next two weeks, and everything else was as we just uh, I just outlined. All right, so some information on the incentives model. Um, vouchers exchangeable for re retail items is the is the financial incentive. They're available uh, and throughout the antepartum period and up to 12 weeks postpartum, and then at 12 weeks we discontinue. Vouchers uh, delivery is contingent on a biochemical test result showing no recent smoking. Uh, so in the first uh, five days of the quit attempt, we're seeing a Monday through Friday, it's a breath CO less than six parts per million. And then during the first assessment in, in uh, the second week, we switch over to urine coatening. That's just um, to allow time for the half-life of coatening to um, pass from smoking that took place before the quit date. And then um, I already mentioned, we're gonna see them in the first five days daily. And then it goes over to twice weekly for the next seven weeks, once weekly for four weeks, every other week until the delivery. And then in the postpartum, we go back to weekly delivery through or weekly assessment through 12 weeks postpartum. Now, in this trial, the, the vouchers varied by baseline cigarettes per day. So we offered those who were smoking 10 cigarettes or less at the intake assessment the following uh, schedule. They started at a, with a voucher that was worth 625. And each time they had a negative test result, that would increment by a dollar and a quarter. And th that would be up to a maximum of $45. And then it would just stabilize. A positive test result would set the uh, voucher values back to initial low level, but then you could reset them back to the pre-reset value by getting two consecutive negative tests. And then women who smoked 10 or more got vouchers twice the value. And again, in, in this population, if you work with them, this, this 10 cigarettes per day or more is just a, an important um, point in terms of difficulties quitting. Those who smoke 10 or more have a lot of difficulty. And um, it turns out that in this trial and um, the women who smoking less than 10 and more than 10 both benefited from the incentives. Um, but when we look compared to our pool, pool data, the prior trials, the, the different, there's no obvious benefit of this escalation that I'm show, mentioning here. I just want to make sure that, that you're aware of it, but it did not influence the outcomes. And so the total mean earnings um, that we paid out in the current trial was 510, and it was 467 in those who were less than, than 10 cigarettes per day, and 560 in those who had more. 
but the, there's no evidence that would suggest that we would continue with this feature of it um, going forward. All right, so just some quick um, uh, participant characteristics. Um, so I'm showing you here the best practices, best practices, financial incentives, the never smokers, and then whether there are any differences between the, the two groups that were smoking and were um, uh, you know, randomized to conditions, and then uh, whether there are any differences between the th three conditions. So we did very well on this randomization, no differences. One, a little bit here, a little bit um, slightly uh, further along in, in the pregnancy by a week. That's not too meaningful. Um, but otherwise, very comparable, but it's very hard to get the get comparable um, sociodemographic characteristics between the never smokers and the smokers. And, and you can see like one example was marital status. Um, that's, that's probably the one that stands out here. Uh, educational attainment, that's it's probably even a bigger one. Um, this one is uh, further in the pregnancy um, when they came into the study. That's just uh, uh, a consequence of the difficulty recruiting and nothing to do with when they go to prenatal care. All right. All right, so then smoking characteristics. Again, we, we did very well in keeping the two randomized groups very, very similar, no, no differences. And then as you might expect, the never smokers are less likely to live with the smoker, less likely to allow smoking in their home or have friends who are smokers. All right, so the, the primary outcome, how did we do in generating point prevalence abstinence? So if we're, we look at the antepartum period, here's the early antepartum assessment, here's the uh, late pregnancy assessment, and we refer to it as the final pregnant antepartum assessment. And you can see this is, we're getting 34 to 38% of the women to be biochemically confirmed abstinence with the incentives, as opposed to four to 9% with the, um, best practices. And then during the postpartum, while the incentives are in place, you can see we have statistically significant greater uh, levels of abstinence in the group that is getting the best practices plus incentives versus the best practices alone. We discontinue the incentives. There's uh, somewhat greater abstinence in the incentives group, but it's not sig statistically significant uh, difference. There is um, the adjusted odds are about like 1.3 to 1.33 in these two analysis. So if we now look at the pool trials, um, we only go out to 24 weeks uh, postpartum there because the current trial is the only one where we went out as far as 48 weeks. But during the antepartum period, the results are almost identical. Um, about 38% of the women abstinent with the um, financial incentives added involved. And then in the control conditions, it's down to five to 10% um, uh, quit rates. And then during the postpartum period, when, you, when the incentives are in place, you know, clear, there's some drop off in absence, no doubt about it. The clear differences between the incentives and the control condition. And then in this, when you have the larger um, number of participants here, at the 24 week, 12 weeks after the incentives are discontinued, you still have a statistically significant uh, difference between the incentivized and the control condition. So when we look postpartum, it's always, or when we look after incentives are discontinued, always higher in the incentives and the control, but it looks like you, 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 know, you would need greater power to detect a statistically significant effect. All right, so this is an interesting one. Um, so we're offering them these financial incentives. They're disadvantaged women. Might you be throwing the women into, you know, untoward levels of craving or withdrawal? So this is the results from the Minnesota nicotine withdrawal scale. This is the single item desire to smoke craving. And then these are uh, the total scores. And um, the answer is emphatically no. What you're doing is you decrease craving with the incentives. So antepartum craving, craving levels in the groups that are getting incentives are significantly below the control levels. And then that's true uh, here through um, throughout the, uh, when the incentives were available. So it's like you're incentivized not to use, you're not craving more, you're craving less. 
And then when you look at withdrawal levels, you uh, see less withdrawal in the incentive group than in the um, control condition. If you look in the pool trials where we have more power and how reliable is this reduction, you see again, the same pattern, you're reducing craving when you're offering incentives and you're actually in, in the pool trials, you're di uh, reducing uh, withdrawal symptoms throughout the um, entire study period. So that was pretty cool. And this is something that's not really received any attention or little attention in prior trials. All right, so this is the one birth outcome that, that we are significantly impacting. And um, so there, and there's two things, two ways we're analyzing the data. Um, all the infants are just restricting the analysis to term infants. And this is influenced by the um, recent Surgeon General's report on smoking cessation. Chapter four includes uh, a lot of information, a lot of great information on reproductive health. And there's some data in there that the uh, preterm delivery can um, be uh, iatrogenic preterm deliveries. A lot of reasons women may be induced to deliver that have nothing to do with smoking related um, problems. And that, that can introduce some variance in um, being able to, some additional variance makes it more difficult to discern the effects of uh, growth restriction, smoking related growth restriction. So we figured, um, and, and then in the Surgeon General's report, some, some studies just use term um, infants and others uh, used everybody, but we thought we would show the results both ways. And so this is everybody, this is term in the current trial, you see the same graded relationship. So when you um, are using best practices only, you have about 17% of the delivery are small for gestational age. If you um, offer the financial incentives, it's um, down to 10% and it's about 2%, two and a half percent in the never smokers. So this graded relationship this, uh, the never smokers differ significantly from the best practices only, and the group that has best practice and incentives doesn't differ significantly from either. When you go to the term infants, now you get a, I think, a more precise, a little less variable estimate. And here, the, and this, the control group stays about the same. Um, the incentive advised group goes down from 10% to about 7%. And the never smokers go down from about uh, two and a half percent to one, one and a half percent. All right, so now you look in the tr pooled uh, trials, how reliable is this effect? Very reliable. If you uh, look at all the, uh, everybody, all the infants in the trials, you get the um, about 15 and a half percent with the in the control uh, SGA deliveries and you cut it to about 7% with the financial incentives. If you look at term, you get a little refinement on that, but not very much of a change. All right, so then we looked at the Vermont wide sample. Is this an externally valid relationship? Is this what you see in the uh, women um, who are delivering in, in our home state? And indeed it is. So that we had 5,000 singleton deliveries and these um, are the uh, never. These are the women who s reported um, smoking throughout the pregnancy or into the third trimester. These are the women who were smoking and quit um, before the the third trimester. And these are the never smokers. You get that same graded relationship that I just showed you for the current trial. If you look in uh, exclusively in the Medicaid insured moms. You get that same graded relationship. Everything's differing. You know, all, all three conditions differ from each other. And uh, this is the type of insurance that most, where most of the smoking during pregnancy is going. So we're very interested in this population for our cost effectiveness analysis. But it's also uh, the same relationship you see in women who have private insurance who also happen to be smoking. When, um, during pregnancy or not smoking, the, the, uh, the same grade relationship. And then the, there's a smaller group have other kinds of insurance. It's just too, too small group to pick up statistically significant effects, but you're seeing uh, the most uh, uh, SGA in the group that smoked all the way through. All right, so um, here I'm just sorry for the quality of slide. I'm just cutting and pasting out the paper that we're writing and showing you. So 
what we're looking at here are the uh, postpartum assessments and the three treatment, well, the two treatment conditions, the never smokers, what percent of women are breastfeeding at each of these assessments. And in the past, when we first start doing this work, you would see significantly more breastfeeding in the incentivized group than a control group. Uh, you don't see that anymore. You still see each time you look, there's a somewhat more going on, somewhat more breastfeeding um, in the incentivized group, but not significantly so, and then still more in the never smoker group. And what happened, I think, is ACOG has um, looked at this issue and thinks that the, is, you know, and put out guidance that the benefits outweigh, the benefits of breastfeeding outweigh the concerns of um, toxin exposure by uh, maternal transmission of the toxin through uh, breast milk. But they still recommend that the um, best practice is to, uh, in the safest practice to protect mom and, and the infant is to abstain during lactation. And so down here, what we looked at is what proportion of women are breastfeeding while sustaining abstinence. And this is where you see a statistically significant effect um, throughout the intervention. So you could see like at two weeks, it's 17% versus 6, 36% in the incentivized group, but then it's 79%. So the pattern here is by incentivizing the women who are smokers, you can significantly improve outcomes with them, but you don't get them to where never smokers are. And this is a reliable effect. You show the same pattern across in the pool data set. All right, so now cost benefit. So we're still waiting on our ICERs. And I wrote down uh, Matt's tip on what, what um, to look up the paper uh, that was helpful to him in the American Journal of Cardiology, Matt, thank you. Um, and I have health economists, but we were rushing to get ICERs. They were, I had 11 o'clock um, Zoom call with one of our health economists. And I said, let's hold on the ICERs and get them right. So what, I'm look what we're looking at here is just a, Send, send a detailed um, analysis of costs and benefits. Um, so the cost of the intervention, and you could see that the intervention costs $361 more, or the incentive intervention than the control intervention. Most of that is labor, because I told you the incentives were only on average about four or $500. Um, but then there, we'll look at the, um, that's where we're so interested in this statewide Medicaid sample to get a sense of, well, um, how, to SGA, how does SGA and smoking status affect um, the cost of healthcare during, at delivery and during the first 12 months of the infant's life. So you, you, you end up recovering, you know, part of this cost and that's good. So you end up um, that you're left with the cost of treatment is that treatment differential is about, um, $668, $67. And then there's another impact that um, I would refer you to this study that's really well done by uh, Anderson et al. in the journal Pediatrics, where they, they had uh, 21 million maternal infant pairs over all, um, from the, they got the data from the CDC over a five-year period. And with that that level, uh, that power, you can really drill down on the relationship between smoking during pregnancy and risk for suicide, sudden unexpected infant death, and both reducing smoking and quitting smoking um, reduces suicide risk significantly. And um, so we did a, a, an economic analysis of those changes we publish in Preventive Medicine, and we applied that here as part of our cost effectiveness analysis. So then you're back up, you know, this is what you recoup. And so it turns out that the societal net benefit of this treatment that I just told you about, its effects in SGA, and as best we can tell, the suet risk, um, you end up about $830 in the black, but there's, there's um, wide variability. So as uh, Jamie was talking about, you know, uncertainty. And it, it has to do with, um, mostly with the um, uh, healthcare cost in Vermont, not to sue it. You don't see that kind of variability. And it's just as you get larger and larger samples, you can get more precise cost estimates. So um, 
Yeah, that's that's as as far as we have gotten. So you get about a sixty one percent return on the dollar. So if you an extra dollar invested to do this incentive intervention, you're recouping a dollar sixty one. But you know there's some uncertainty, and we're going to have to continue to look at this. And um, as I mentioned several times now, we're going to do the ICERs, looking at suet and looking at the fact that the women, there was evidence that the women who got the incentives were still more likely to be abstinent um, after they were discontinued at 24 weeks postpartum. So um, just to wrap up, I think there's over, I hope I've convinced you, overwhelming evidence that financial incentives can increase any part of absence. These um, are the largest effect sizes in randomized controlled trials in this the Cochrane uh, Review has a series on women, uh, smoke and cessation in pregnant women, and um, you know incentives do very well. Effects on absence remain robust through the uh, 12 weeks postpartum as long as you have incentives in place, but the effects after discontinuation um, remain above controls across current and pooled trials, but only significant in the, in the pooled data set. Um, effects of incentives on SGA is consistent across current uh, trial, pool trials, Vermont wine study. That's a real effect. And I think in wrapping up like this 20 years of research in this, with this paper, I hope, um, at least in, in clinic base, um, that the, uh, I'm trying to show you what I think we, we know with confidence. And the first three things uh, I think we know with confidence. Um, the effects on, on continuing to breastfeed by, while absent, I feel pretty confident about that as well. And I think it shows one of the multifaceted ways you can increase, by increasing absence, you can foster better health um, as well. And then the economic analysis is supporting the cost uh, benefit and the preliminary ICER suggests cost effectiveness, but, but with some uh, level of uncertainty. So um, to improve reach, we've developed and pilot tested a smartphone translation of what I just told you. Uh, about and the efficacy was was supported and then we just completed a fully randomized trial which we're just preparing and should be submitting for publication shortly also supporting the efficacy so i'll stop there thanks thanks steve uh it's a great presentation i've seen you know being in the vcbh seen some of these data before but just seeing it all in the same place struck by the consistency across trials and the replication. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite all the panelists to come back. And uh, Steve, I'm not sure if you're able to stop sharing your screen there. But that yeah, let, me, me. Um, let me get set up here. We have a couple, while he's doing that, we have a couple of questions coming in from the audience, but feel free to post those in the question and answer box and I will uh, read those off to our presenters. All in all, really exciting uh, group of presentations here, spanning a lot of information um, and some important future directions. So thanks to all of you for presenting today. I'll start with uh, one of the earlier questions. We had a couple come in about e-cigarettes. Um, and here's one specifically, uh, Dr. Jody Petraska. So studies in the UK show that access to e-cigarettes can assist addicted sm smokers in transitioning off of cigarettes, if FDA gave, gives market approval to an e-cigarette, is that something that ought to be evaluated with patients with mental health disorders, since many patients are also using them? And then others commented on the UK uh, use of e-cigarettes among folks with mental illness. Great, thank you. And I saw there was some other um, in the Q&A that maybe is kind of related, so I'll, I'll try to pull those together so we don't have to go back through. Um, and there, there has been this kind of narrative since the morning, I think Michael Siegel raised the question about how the US is kind of failing in um, terms of progress with randomized controlled trials for e-cigarettes mm -hmm. for quitting smoking. And then it was asked again during uh, Neil Benowitz's talk and he did address it to some level. Um, in, Michael Siegel, I would think knows this already, but the way e-cigarettes came into the US, it came in and was allowed to go right to direct to market. So we do have e-cigarettes available. People with mental illness have access to e-cigarettes in the US. You go to 7-Eleven, you go to a vape shop, they're freely available online. You can have it mailed to you. 
Um, so in most areas, e-cigarettes are freely available. What we don't have available is the evidence that they actually help people quit smoking in the U.S. with the products that we have, with the high nicotine salt products that we have. Um, and then the, you know, turning it on the researchers and saying, why aren't the researchers doing these studies? We can't because you need the IND. And, and Neil went through that. So you go through CEDAR if you want a therapeutic indication. That was very clearly stated in the court case that allowed e-cigarettes to go to, to, to continue to be sold as a tobacco product. Um, so to go through CEDAR, you know, yes, it costs money, but you know, Pfizer does it, GSK does it. An e-cigarette company could do it. You know, Altria gave $12.8 billion to Juul. They could have had as part of that negotiation that there be a, a push to get therapeutic indication as a cessation device. Juul could have used some of that money to pursue that. So yes, it's expensive, but there's a process and, and that's how it's done. You know, and to have the clinicians turn and just to recommend these, that, that's reckless. You know, that's that's you don't know what you're what you're recommending. You don't know the safety of it. Just this week, data came out of Johns Hopkins showing that there's 2,000 chemicals that are unidentified. You only know what you study. And these products are, are still very new and have not been out you know, long enough to see the long-term consequences. Um, so you know, if they're shown to be proven to be effective, absolutely. You know, you know, there is a new treatment modality that we'd have available. But until that time, yeah, I'm wary of doing so. I, you know, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point that we're limited in the amount of research uh, in the U.S. that we're able to do on e-cigarettes. Um, so so. Can, I, can I make a quick comment on that? So there are, uh, Jody and, and Neil are absolutely correct that it's the, the regulatory hurdles present challenges in the U.S. for doing e-cig trials. Um, there are you know, creative ways to sort of um, get around that. I mean, um, looking at reduction cigarettes smoking as an outcome, uh, looking at naturalistic changes in smoking. So we've, the sampling studies that I've shown you, we've done sampling studies and have an ongoing large scale trial of sampling e-cigs versus not, uh, that's coming near completion. So um, it's not the best science uh, because it's not the same as, um, you know, a clinical trial for smoking cessation, as you might see in New Zealand or Italy or elsewhere. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's getting close. And I, I think that those studies would be helpful. Yeah, maybe I will mention one more thing too. If there were data, like I also wouldn't necessarily start with the most vulnerable population. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, I think vulnerable populations should be included in research, but I would have some concern about going straight to individuals with schizophrenia to do your clinical trial for smoking cessation. And I'm aware that, you know, Juul is funding a study right now in Italy, so they don't have the FDA and IND um, concern, but, you know, Ricardo Pelosa has reached out to me to see if I would give him advice on how to, how to do this, people with schizophrenia. I've got reservations on that. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point that you make. I mean, even if you were Juul, you may want to start with a more stable population in terms of being able to discern efficacy. Um, you know, so I think you make an interesting and valid point uh, in terms of research strategy. Just looking, if you real, really want to just understand whether it works, it may not be the best idea to start in the most complicated patient population or smoking population. We've dedicated a lot of time to e-cigarettes, so I'll, I'll move on to another question here that cuts across a couple of presentations. So uh, this attendee says, Dr. Higgins, very interesting findings in regard to reduced craving for the incentive groups. And wondering if Dr. Dr. Carpenter, have you seen similar findings in NRT research uh, in terms of reduced cravings from your uh, sampling? Matt, I think you might still be muted here. After almost two years of this, I still make those mistakes. So uh, have we looked at craving um, uh, as a function of sampling? Uh, that is not a, if, if we have, I don't have the data available to me in my head. Um, that's not a, 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 a mechanism that we typically look at for these sampling studies, if only because we know that NRT already reduces craving. So I'm not sure that my study would be the, a good test of that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we're interested more in the non-pharmacologic effects of sampling, such as, you know, uh, motivation, uh, confidence, um, treatment self-regulation, those types of things. But uh, you, so the, to the answer, the short answer to this question is no, we don't typically look at craving as an, as an outcome in these sampling studies. Yeah. The one thing I can add um, is that we began work on this incentive approach with psychomotor stimulants. And it was back, first study was in 1991. Um, and we did see this same phenomenon, but honestly, I was sort of like Matt was, I wasn't that interested in it and I didn't really attend to it. I can remember one time having a conversation with Alan Leshner, who was the director of NIDA then saying, because he was very concerned about craving. I was saying that CM was uh, decreasing use and decreasing craving. And uh, he, he just kind of moved on, but they, it's not the first time I've seen that kind of co-variation where you get control over use and you get control over craving at the same time with incentives. Um, so I think it's more interesting than I was aware of or than I realized in the previous um, uh, studies with cocaine. And now that kind of uh, work in California is in the process of passing legislation to uh, implement CM for psychomotor stimulants um, because of the uptick in, in methamphetamine. So we might have an opportunity to look um, in, in that work to see if you see the same relationship. Matt, just following up here, one, um, an, another question on your NRT sampling. Uh, wondering to hear your thoughts or, or maybe some more thoughts on why you might be seeing this effect where some of those who are most vulnerable to tobacco use might be seeing the most, the strongest effect from the NRT, those in high rurality, I think low income, there might've been a few others. It looks like we might be muted or having trouble hearing you, but actually I don't see- um, No, 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 yeah, so I've got this thing. That's twice I've made that mistake, I'm sorry. Sometimes it doesn't show I'm muted and in fact, I, I mute myself. So it raises more questions than it answers. That's the cheap way of answering that question. Uh, but so I hearken back to some of the studies that I did a little bit in, but others did a lot more and stronger work in that there remains a lot of enduring misperceptions about what these medications are. Um, you know, I'm going to get addicted to them. They're not safe. They were, uh, they weren't tested on people like me, uh, you know, all kinds of misperceptions, misperceptions that are really recalcitrant in certain demographics of smokers who are less likely to use them for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think sampling is a way for people to overcome and try out these products without a firm commitment to use them for good. And it's a way to dispel some of these, um, uh, misperception. So in uh, earlier NRT sampling studies that we did, uh, but not the one that I presented on, uh, we looked at attitudes towards uh, NRT, both positive, I like it, it's great, and negative. Um, you know, this is, I, it doesn't taste good, etc. those types of things. And then just straight up knowledge, you know, facts about what NRT is and isn't. And we looked, we, we found that, um, Positive attitudes went up, negative attitudes went down, and I'm forgetting the outcome right now on knowledge as a function of NRT sampling. So I think it's a way for some groups of smokers who might be otherwise reticent to use them to sort of come around to them. That's a short way of answering that, or not so short. Hey, Matt, I don't know if you noticed, but tomorrow at during the noon hour, there's a program on tobacco use in rural populations. So that observation you had, it may, yeah, we had I a did new see center that. on rural addiction, and it's a HRSA center where we're supposed to try and bring evidence-based um, observations, mostly in opioid use disorder, but also in tobacco uh, to clinicians and policymakers yeah. in, in rural communities. So, Right. Well, thank you for reminding me. I do have that agenda right here in front of me. And, yeah. and not to oversell this at all. I mean, there's, lot, there's lots of pitfalls and, and, you know, outcomes are low, but it is something that I can distribute to smokers all around the state of South Carolina, right. all around the country in a sense. Um, and I can, you know, selectively choose pockets of, of poverty and rurality and other 
things. So we know that smokers are less likely to come into our uh, clinics and our lab. I mean, Charleston, South Carolina is on the coast. Uh, ironically enough, we have traffic problems. Uh, Jody might laugh at that. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people don't come in for treatment. So we've got to bring right. it to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why we're going with the smartphone with the pregnant smokers. I mean, it's good intervention, but if you have to be seen as frequently as we're seeing the women, that's not going to have much reach. So, yeah. Danielle, I had a question for, for your presentation. I was really struck by that tape where you presented, I think it was about five RCTs uh, with uh, no, no significant differences between the active and active control conditions. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what the mechanism might be among those trials where we're seeing benefits to therapy, but no difference between the, uh, I think it was like training uh, procedures and the, the active controls. Right. I mean, these were all um, in assessment and attention heavy clinical yeah. trials. There's a lot of face to face contact with research personnel who are caring and supportive and express interest in how you're doing and ask you a lot of questions that, you know, presumably trigger you to think deeply about um, how things are going. And that was constant across um, the treatment conditions. And uh, it does sort of raise this hypothesis hypothesis about nonspecific effects of um, our therapies. And yes, we can see something when we compare a face-to-face -face treatment versus um, a booklet. But when we are comparing the two face-to-face -face treatments together, the effects are really hard to detect. They seem quite small or non-existent. Yeah, along with that, I wonder if you have any thoughts on you know, the sub-additivity in those factorial trials. Uh, it was also pretty striking to see that. And do you, th any, I mean, is there the, any research, I don't, I'm not familiar with it, but is there any research that's been done on how these components are combined as opposed to simply stacking them on each other? Um, could there be importance to the way or the synergy between the, the components? Absolutely, I mean, I think you, when you design um, a package, you often design it with efficiency and connectivity between the components in mind. When you're doing a factorial study, you're sort of trying to keep them independent. And so you're layering them on top of each other in a way that may not make the most sense. And I, I have a colleague right now who's trying to figure out how to, to um, look at an ad, a, a sort of a biobehavioral adjunct to smoking cessation counseling and working really hard to keep them independent. But then from, the participant's perspective, that's really weird because I have two different people I talk to about two di totally different things and I'm making connections in my head, but my treatment team won't make those connections, right? So it becomes a little bit odd. Um, I don't think that was such a huge issue with any of the three factorial studies that we talked about because we weren't trying to keep them completely independent. Um, we were manipulating them independently, but it was okay to reference, you know, the phone calls you're getting here and the feedback you're getting about your gum use over there. Um, but I, I think it was, it's just too much. It's just too many different things coming at you. And we see evidence that supports all three of the mechanistic hypotheses. Burden, it's, you know, we burn you out, kind of, we throw so much at you that you start doing things less. Um, you know, you only get so much craving reduction and we throw two more things at you, you don't, your craving doesn't dip that much lower. And, um, you know, there's a, we saw a moderation by, if we, we created a relapse proneness or propensity score, and we split the sample based on that. And the people who had the lowest relapse proneness, the highest propensity toward abstinence, they showed the, the least decrement with the addition of additional factors, you know, so, they just needed a little bit of something to get to abstinent. And the people who started out far away, they showed some benefit with additional um, components that the people who were close to abstinence in the beginning didn't. So I think there's evidence to support all three of those possibilities. And it does really speak to the importance of if we're gonna combine components, that we do it in a really thoughtful way, informed by our understanding of mechanism, individual differences that might interact with the components we're putting together, and burden. Yo. Judy, I, I have a question for you. Um, the um, 
I was very impressed by you showed that treatment effect, I, I guess, in your own hospital where, where you normally do your research and then took the same intervention to the hospital that treats more diverse samples, um, I guess, more community hospital and replicated there. It was uh, I thought that was terrific. What's your sense of um, uptake of that work? You know, you, you made the point that this wasn't, any kind of fancy treatments, just the basics, implement it well, and you were getting nice treatment effects. Do you, I realize it would probably be hard to track, but do you get a sense that community hospitals are using it? Um, it's just curious. Yeah, that's a great question. And that mechanism of building the research, I just want to give a shout out to Career Development Awards. So that was a, a K award that started at UCSF Lingley Porter. Uh, took it, Norval Hickman led the next study that we did at the county hospital, yeah. San Francisco General, and then an R01 that took it over to um, the East Bay and down to Stanford. You know, what we saw, I was, it important that your science continue to advance because we did see, start to see changes in the system. So at Langley Porter, I think it is the first hospital to go smoke free, but they weren't treating tobacco. And that's where we saw the, the, the high risk of smoking as soon as they left. Uh, when we came back to do the trial, they were using NRT on hospital. And that was part of our standard care anyways, so that you know we were matching that. It's not like, you know. And then um, as we um, went on, in, in any kind of time you do a research study, you need the medical director really on board. Right. Uh, and then when you get that, you can get system level changes. So we did see really nice improvements um, at Langley Porter, at San, uh, San Francisco General, at all the Bates in, the, in Berkeley and down at Stanford. And we would do our best that we, to leave materials that could be readily handed out. So at a minimum, referrals to the quit line and use of NRT on hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's a good achievement because uh, Eli and I have tried to make some kinds of changes like that in our hospital. It's not easy to make. So I, I commend you on that. And, and to do it in the context of research and be able to show uh, efficacy while you're at it. That's great. And another individual who did really nice dissemination work, and he was an advisor on my K, Bar Taylor, and he did general hospital work and um, so created in hospital cessation treatment program and then how you disseminate that. Um, and then also um, uh, Andrew, um, the Ottawa model. Um, that's fantastic. I mean, they disseminated that all across Canada, you know, to all the promises, all the promises. Nice. Sometimes you wonder, it's, you know, it's not easy to get it out of, out of the research mode and into uh, the community settings and whatnot. So it's not a minor accomplishment. And along those lines, you know, Matt, it seems like this body of research on sampling really bridges that gap, you know, this last trial, especially on RT. Uh, was in the community. Can you speak to it all? I mean, has, has there been any movement in terms of practices in South Carolina um, continuing this after the trial ended or other places using this? Uh, I don't have great evidence of uh, a continuation of the, of the trials, that, of, the, uh, of, of the clinics that we used. I will say that there's a great interest in this. Um, I mean, because, you know, I give that dentist analogy and everybody's like, you know, the, the uh, I get it. And, and like, I don't need to explain it anymore. Uh, they get it. Um, so if it has that appeal to it, um, you, you know, giving out samples uh, to smokers as they're leaving the hospital. Um, Nancy Rigotti's done that. You know, we're, we've done some of that as well. Uh, I mean, there, there's applications in various settings, uh, various populations. Um, I, I think it, uh, it has lots of potential. Um, as for the sustainability of our particular uh, clinics, I, I can't comment on that um, because we, once we were done with the clinics, we were done with the clinics. And that's an unfortunate oversight. I mean, it would be great if I knew and I had a, a data on, um, you know, continuance on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Steve, I know there's been a big push, you know, uh, to get contingency management disseminated, um, and then particularly with pregnant women, given the data you presented today. I don't know if you want to speak at all to what that process is like, or any thoughts on where where that might be headed. Um, well, <laughs> it's hard to know. I mean, what I see is it it kind of gets out into the ether and it starts showing up. I think. Um, 
you know, the, the fact that incentives are part of the um, Vermont quit line now, we, we didn't, when we designed a study, we didn't even know that. And maybe it wasn't the case when we first wrote the grant, but then we go to find out exactly what is going on in the Vermont quit line and they have integrated incentives, um, you know, on, on taking the calls as opposed to abstinence. Um, but but that, I think that's a positive step in the right direction. I would recommend to put it on the absence if we can get them the technology to cost effectively verify absence uh, remotely. Um, so I'm optimistic and I, I am now, <laughs> I've grown to learn to be patient. The fact that that legislation I mentioned in California is happening now when the first study was published in 1991, <laughs> <laughs> it can take a while. And, and actually, I got some criticism early in that process around, around incentivizing absence from illicit drug use about why we were doing the studies and um, community clinics weren't using the evidence as though it, you know, it was our fault. And so I... Um, I looked into what, on average, is the the, the um, time frame that medical advances work their way out into community practice, and at that time it was 17 years. Um, so it's not specific to us. Um, it ju it just takes time. And and Eli, we um, um, uh, Christine Sheffer talked about this today, but so us trying to move the um, abstinence-based incentives into the Vermont quit line. So we've explored that. Our health department's wonderful. We collaborate with them. They're very interested. But there are existing contracts already with National Jewish Health. So it isn't so easy that just because the health department wants to do it, that, wow, we're ready to go. Uh, but I was happy to learn, learn that Christine is actually um, has a big role over in the New York quit line. So I'm going to I want to talk to her about that possibility. But there, there are these kinds of um, just kind of complicating factors that I think slow dissemination down uh, generally. And then, um, you know, I, I uh, have a history of going for large effect sizes, especially when I'm dealing with pregnant women. I just find it hard to not do that. Um, so, you know, I don't always help myself in terms of scaling, but we're doing our best and we've moved to that smartphone and the data look really good with that. You can reach nationally. Um, and then we're also interested in, um, we're going to do a pilot study with uh, Native Alaska women where tobacco use during pregnancy is a huge problem. It was very interesting is the elders uh, in in some of the tribal communities became aware of the incentive-based interventions and asked for that intervention because some of the other interventions weren't helping. So, so I, yeah, I'm patient. I think, I think if it's helpful, eventually it'll get out, I think. We had an example here in Wisconsin where we did a study for incentives for uh, abstinence and engagement for prepartum and postpartum uh, women. And um, after the study was over, which was funded by CMS, um, they adopted them. They implemented them. They go statewide and serve women statewide, and they are now have giving gift cards for completing home visits as part of their base program and uh, additional gift cards for abstinence. So oh, it's wonderful. really exciting to see that that, you know, it's much smaller scale. Um, it's a program that serves about um, a thousand women a year, um, but mm -hmm. statewide, it's exciting. Well, yeah. uh, just can I ask a quick methods question around that? How do you assess uh, for contingency management on abstinence? You've got to have a biological verification, oh. do you not? And how would you do that on such a scale? So they um, do home visits, and it's the, they have been bringing the CO monitors to home visits. Okay. Now, during COVID, they switched to phone and self-report, but they're talking about remote uh, CO monitors and um, trying to make it uh, great. do, you know, it, uh, something they can carry out even in pandemic conditions. Yeah, awesome. This has been a really great conversation. Thanks everybody for uh, the presentations and the, the questions afterward here. Um, before we end, I want to remind all the audience and, and everyone else to uh, attend poster sessions one and two uh, 
poster session one starts at 415 and two starts at 515. So hope to see everyone there. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Thanks, Eli.